Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Richard Melendez. In our show this time, we'll cover the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum's annual briefing to the legislature on the state of energy in Hawaii. It involved presentations by a number of energy officials and experts to the legislature and the public in the Capitol Auditorium. The Hawaii Energy Policy Forum includes 46 members, representing federal, state, and local government, academia, utilities, oil and gas companies, labor, renewable energy trade associations, and environmental organizations. This is the 12th annual briefing the forum has presented to update the legislature and the public on how things are going and what needs to be considered at the upcoming session. In recent months, we've seen the price of oil plummeting. At around $32 a barrel today, with lots of volatility to come, we need to work even harder to avoid the temptation of forgetting our goals. We adopted the goal of 100% renewables by 2045 last year, but getting there is another thing. This is not something we can wait until 2045 to do. It's something we have to do now. We have to make progress every day, including today. Where are we today? Hawaii is a model in rooftop solar, but we're still working on community solar, the smart grid, and renewable fuel production. We haven't yet set a target for clean transportation, although we did decide that transportation should use 30% non-fossil fuels by 2030. Easier said than done. Our legislature and the public need to know about the status of our efforts on clean energy, emerging energy technologies and research, and the way we can coordinate our technological and entrepreneurial efforts and advances to build a robust and resilient clean energy industry. Policymakers and the public have to be well informed about the priorities and the options and obstacles to getting them done. A short-term approach won't work. What does the legislature need to do to make long-term progress on this crucial initiative? The opening speaker for the briefing was Representative Chris Lee, Chair of the House Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. There are three things, I think more than anything this year, that um, come to mind when we talk about 100% renewable, when we talk about hydrogen, when we talk about all these different things that each of us has our hand in a piece of. And those things are, number one, what it is that we're going to pay and what it is that we're going to benefit from in the immediate future. Number two, how is this going to affect us here in our state at a time when we're looking out for climate adaptation, mitigation, and other things that we're now being forced as taxpayers to pay for to, to just survive beyond. And the third thing is, what is it going to mean for us here this year? What is it going to mean for us? What do we have to do in each of our respective roles to get us where we want to go? There are three things, three other things I wanted to talk about very briefly. Um, number one, that I think is probably at the centerpiece of all of this, you thought I was going to talk about Nextera, but I'm not, but the role of the utilities, no matter who controls them, and their evolution to a new model that allows all of us to participate in a new way, which the PUC is just beginning their due diligence on right now. How do we transition those utilities to a model of a grid operator? on which all of us, whether projects large or small, on rooftops or out in uh, neighbor islands, can all participate and play a role. Secondly, how do we as responsible leaders of our state ensure that the taxpayers are taken care of, not just ratepayers, but taxpayers on their end? Because we pay hundreds of millions of dollars a year on our electric bill for our public facilities and institutions. About this time last year, as I was, I think, on that side of the stage giving the same talk, we talked about, well, what, what are we going to do? What are those first steps going to be? And we've since come quite far. The University of Hawaii now has a um, statutory mandate, actually, to be generating 100% of its own power renewably by 2035. And if anyone's got the resources and expertise, the people in this room, the state of Hawaii, backing this project can help make this thing happen. We've got opportunities for microgrids, for integrating new technologies, for efficiency, all coming together to make our campuses on each island models and laboratories for what could be. And the last thing I want to talk about, which Jay highlighted briefly, was transportation, which is the real 800-pound gorilla in the room, which comprises the vast majority of our energy that we use. How do we get off of our dependence on fossil fuels there? In an industry which, compared to the electricity side of things, is still early on in its growth. How do we get to a place where we can take 
hydrogen technologies, EV technologies, and all these things and implement them in a meaningful, scalable way. Then we heard from Sharon Moriwaki, co-chair of the forum, on the forum's work in advancing clean energy this year. Mike Hamnett, the other co-chair of the forum, told us about the public survey the forum conducted for the briefing. So we need to, to do more to inform the public. Our Energy Wednesday shows, briefings such as this, our Clean Energy Day, our website, and soon the clean energy performance data will be available electronically for the total anyone in, in, in our community. We hope this briefing and other public outreach education efforts will inform, foster dialogue, and engage everyone. The survey sought to inform and obtain input on clean energy issues. These included renewable energy goals in electricity and transportation, what could be done to achieve those goals, reason, personal reasons that people believe that we should be pursuing clean energy goals, what respondents themselves would be willing to do, how much respondents have followed clean energy issues, and about the importance of climate change to Hawaii's energy future. The results are only representative of the opinions of the people that were surveyed, but I think uh, there are indications that it's more uh, representative of people involved in energy issues more generally. About 70% of the survey, so second slide, about 70% of the survey respondents said they've been regularly or actively involved in efforts to reduce Hawaii's dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, respondents came from all four counties and ranged in age from 20 to 70. Um, the following are just some highlights of the, the results of the survey. Almost 70% of survey re respondents said preserving the environment and minimizing climate change and making Hawaii more self energy self-sufficient were the most important reasons for pursuing clean energy. Slide three. Over 73% of respondents said that they were personally willing to reduce their daily use of fossil fuels and over 78% said they were willing to support construction of renewable energy projects on their islands and in their neighborhoods. Over 46% said they support higher taxes on fossil fuels if that money was used to support the further development of renewable energy. To brief us on climate change as a critical consideration in energy planning, we heard from Chip Fletcher, Associate Dean of the UH School of Earth Science and Technology, SOEST, and the Forum's own Ben Sullivan, who is the Energy and Sustainability Coordinator for Kauai. Here are the temperature uh, rankings of the last 17 years, and you can see that there's almost a full third of a degree warmer um, that, has been, that has been achieved by 2015 compared to previous years. So, this, this is both uh, data from NOAA and from NASA. It was an incredibly warm year, and um, for reasons I can't go into here, there, there is fear that we are actually entering a, a new phase of something that's known as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which may engender much stronger warming year after year as we move forward over the next decade or more than we have seen in the past decade or two. So how does this climate change, which is a global problem, uh, track down to our state, Hawaii. Sea level rise is one impact resulting from global climate change. Heat waves, changing precipitation patterns, changing storminess, ocean acidification and warming, and ecosystem threats. And I'm gonna work quickly through each of these uh, over the next couple of minutes. Sea level rise uh, arrives in several different forms. NASA last month announced that given what we know now about the, how the ocean expands as it warms and how ice sheets and glaciers are adding water to the seas, it's pretty certain that we are locked into at least three feet of sea level rise and probably more. So this is a good number to begin to model the impacts of future sea level rise along our shorelines. Sea level rise arrives at our doorstep in several ways. There's coastal erosion which accelerates with sea level rise. There's wave flooding, the large waves of the year will flood further into uh, the land. There's groundwater inundation which rises, the groundwater table rises as the sea level rises because they're connected. We have cheap domestic oil and gas, we have a rebounding economy, and, and that, oh, that gas is, and oil is being produced here in the U.S. Um, prices way down, let me see. You know, the, the, the question we have to ask ourselves, is there a risk? Is there a risk of stalling out here? I mean, you know, we've had a, a much bigger room full of people in the past, and I'm not saying that's the only measure, but certainly there was a lot more enthusiasm for clean energy when oil was, uh, was north of $100 a barrel than perhaps there is today. And, you know, in fact, we can look at the national trends that have happened recently with regards to vehicles, and we've seen that 
that uh, fleet efficiency standards and new vehicle purchases has started to kind of come back down again. You know, those, those SUVs are starting to look attractive. Um, so, you know, what's the difference? What's the difference today? So one thing we do have going for us today with regards to climate change and mitigation is we finally, finally have the arrival of global leadership. So, you know, getting to the punchline, perhaps the most significant change, again, between, between today and 2008 is we have every country on the planet, essentially, agreeing to, to where we need to get. And so, you know, this is a little bit wonky, and are there some of my other slides, but basically what you got here is, is what Dr. Fletcher talked about. You know, we are already locked into a significant amount of global warming. We're already locked into a significant amount of impacts, and we're going to have to deal with those. But we do have a fundamental choice here. We have, you know, we can do a little bit, and we can get a lot of temperature change, or we can do a lot and get a little bit of temperature change. To brief us on transportation energy issues, we heard from Ford Fuchikami, the State Director of Transportation, and Mark Garrity, reporting from the city and county of Honolulu. Uh, Governor and I, Louis Salaverio, is in the back. We attended the Women in Renewable Energy. And at, during that um, breakfast conference, Governor announced that uh, Ford was going to take a lead on clean energy as it related to the Department of Transportation which is great. Unfortunately, I didn't know anything about clean energy. So it became a real hard challenge for me. One of the biggest challenges was that uh, I couldn't figure out why my predecessors never got involved with clean energy. And I found out real quickly, it's a lot of hard work. It's damn hard. And we didn't have the staffing, we didn't have the ability to go ahead and take this on. But that being said, governor asked me to do it, I was going to do it. And with the assistance of my special assistant who's back there, David Rodriguez, uh, I think we've done a hell of a job in moving this thing forward. <laughs> but that being said, I attended my first Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative uh, meeting and at the door they were passing out this Hawaii 2015 energy report card done by Blue Planet. And this is what I saw. Transportation D minus. Right under the D minus, I don't know if you see it, but it says previously D minus. <laughs> and then it also said it was a three year study. I went online and I tried to look for the third year. Fortunately, I couldn't find it, but I'm pretty sure it would have said D minus as well. So what I did is I called Shem, and I actually we ran into, I, I ran into him at a conference and I told Shem, you know, what, what am I doing wrong? What can we do? And you know, and I appreciate basically the email he sent me and I'm gonna read it to you so you fully understand. He said, to be clear, the grade for the transportation sector is not aimed at any one department or entity, but is based on a comparison between the actual fossil use used in transportation against a target trend line that would eliminate fossil fuel use by 2040. So I felt a little bit better. I do wanna talk about some of the things that we are doing. And uh, there's basically, there's two, uh, a, a sort of a two-pronged approach that we are making. And, uh, and that is to make our vehicles, the things that, that we have control over, uh, greener. That the city and county has uh, purchases on a regular basis, uses fuel for the things that we need to do to, to uh, provide all those services that the, that the city and county provides. And then the second is to try to make uh, trips greener. That is uh, trying to actually uh, encourage people to use uh, modes themselves that are, that are cleaner. And we, and we can affect both of those things and we're doing things uh, in both of those uh, areas to improve the situation. Um, I'm gonna focus on, on transit a little bit because uh, especially my Department of Transportation Services, we, we uh, uh, run the bus, um, and we have close uh, connection with Hart, uh, who is now building the, the rail transit project. So I'm going to talk about those a little bit, uh, talk about our other city fleet vehicles, and then uh, talk about generally about transportation, especially our efforts towards bicycle and transportation modes. The next panel briefed us on what it will take to get to 100% renewables by 2045. The panel included Mark Glick, Administrator of the State Energy Office, Chris Yunker, Manager of Energy Systems and Planning in the State Energy Office, and Rick Rochelot, Director of the Natural Energy Institute at UH-HNEI. When Governor Ige signed uh, Hawaii's landmark 100% portfolio standard, it, 
he and, of course, the legislature removed any ambiguity whatsoever about where the state's headed. And, you know, I, by becoming the first state in the nation uh, to make such a bold commitment by day certain, we, we effectively defined the end state by which we want to achieve and removed all ambiguity about where we're headed. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of an RPS, a firm uh, guide, guiding star uh, to, to help us um, plan for action. You know, what, where are we headed? And we're going to be working very closely this session with the legislature to improve the definitions that the RPS represents a more accurate p picture of our renewable energy progress. Uh, so Henry uh, and, uh, and many others, we, we're going to be reaching out to you on that. Now, as we work to uh, achieve this ambitious goal, it's important that the course we set is guided by some fundamental principles. And, you know, part of it's fairly obvious. We, we want to favor a diversity of lowest cost solutions without compromising reliability and uh, energy security over the life cycle of infrastructure investments. I'm here today to talk to you a little about the efforts that Energy System and Planning Branch in the Hawaii State Energy Office is doing towards moving towards 100% renewable energy. And one of the focuses of the discussion here today will be essentially the decision framework by which we're looking at getting there. Um, in taking you through some of the critical aspects that we look about in terms of how we go about making decisions to bridge the gap between where we are today and 100% renewable energy, I want to just touch on three critical aspects in my time here. And one is that we need to understand the entire energy ecosystem. Another is that we need to understand what is required to transform our existing energy system to one that can support 100% renewable. Time to kind of talk about how we get to the 100%, and, and I think what I'm going to do is probably, as I usually do, kind of put a couple of words of caution in terms of, of kind of maintaining that diversity of the resource and diversity of the plan that we just heard about it and how we put that path together. So I want to move along pretty quick. So, you know, in the past we've talked a lot, this systems modeling, we're doing a GE and gone through the process and what it is, and it's, and it's very system to what, similar to what Chris is doing, other people, Matthias Fripp from the university have various models. Um, I think what sets us apart right now is that while we've been doing this for quite a while and really put together a good team, we also have incorporated a lot of other stakeholders into the process. So we have DBED, the Public Utilities Commission, utility, independent energy producers, looking at the models, looking at the data, looking at the assumptions. And I think this is a really important thing going forward. There's a lot of commonality in the models, but you can pretty much go anywhere you want depending on what you put in. So coming together to to agree on some of the basic numbers are going to help us narrow down a little bit on what we can and can't do and what makes sense. Um, so that's kind of, I've shown that graph in the middle before, that's kind of the overall process similar to what other people are doing. Previous studies, we really showed that, you know, with the utility making changes that they're currently making, reducing, you know, min runs and a lot of what they do in their systems, there are pathways to 40% renewables, wind and solar. If you've got geothermal and biomass, those are extra. Those are dispatchable. So you can add that on top. But 40% wind and solar pathways. But those are all mixed resources. It's a little difficult if it's really solar dominant. The next panel dealt with the need for collaboration. It included Mina Morita, energy consultant and former chair of the PUC, Don Lippert, director of the Hawaii Energy Accelerator, and Darren Okamoto, associate director of the Sea Grant College at UH Manoa how we tackle these long-term and complex challenges with limited resources will take innovation, collaboration, and partnerships. And as we move forward with Hawaii's clean energy transformation, every aspect of our lives will be touched. How we live, work, and play, how we think and use and talk about energy, how we plan, innovate, and execute to achieve to achieve this transformation will be required. So we need some successful models out there to take on these complex issues and um, needed for this forward uh, progress. One thing that people may not know about what happened in Paris and the Paris Agreement is that as part of that agreement, something happened called mission innovation, which is a commitment that Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Benioff and many of the other sort of billionaires in the tech space and sort of around the world made to investing in clean energy innovation. And the commitment they made was $20 billion over the next few years invested in clean energy innovation. 
So that is a, that's basically an order of magnitude above what we've invested in the last couple of years in energy innovation. And what that means to, to us as an, as an innovation program and I think as a state is that we need to figure out a way to get Hawaii uh, on the path of that amount of resources and that money. The path to 100% clean energy around the world has to go through Hawaii. And I think what we're doing on the innovation side is particularly looking at how to do that. What I hope to demonstrate is how Sea Grant actually demonstrates these characteristics of, of integration, uh, innovation, and cooperation. And, and how our position is well, and our, how our program is well positioned to actually address the energy, water, climate, and other types of priority uh, needs that our coastal communities are facing. With all of that, we can never forget the role of energy efficiency. We've saved over $12 billion in the past six years through Hawaii Energy's incentives and energy savings tips. No matter what we do to achieve 100% clean energy in Hawaii, energy efficiency is by far the most cost-effective element in reaching our energy goals. These are exciting times in clean energy. The important thing is to keep current and focused on our goal of being a clean energy state with 100% clean energy coming soon. Who knows, but maybe if we work hard, we'll be able to get there before 2045. Wouldn't that be great? Thanks to the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum for helping us keep informed. Want to know more? Visit hawaiienergypolicy.hawaii.edu or tune in to our Energy Wednesday show at 4 p.m. every Wednesday on thinktechhawaii.com. And now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from noon to 5 p.m. on weekday afternoons, and then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long, and some people listen to them all night long. If you miss a show or you want to replay or share any show, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and on YouTube. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and our live stream and YouTube links, or better yet, to sign on to our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech video studio at Pioneer Plaza. We invite you to come down, see our studio, and be part of our live audience. Contact me, Jay, at thinktechhawaii.com. Be a part of our civic engagement here on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We want to know what you're thinking and how you feel about current issues and events affecting Hawaii. We want you to stay in touch with us, and we want to stay in touch with you. Let's think together.
On March 17th, we'll present a luncheon panel program to explore ways in which people in the Native Hawaiian community can reach their goals other than by reinventing sovereignty. Our program is called Solutions Beyond Sovereignty and will be presented in the sixth floor auditorium in 1132 Bishop Street on Fort Street Mall. Want to speak out about a community issue or event? You can. ThinkTech invites you to come down to our studio and make a video at what we call our Speaker's Corner. If you'd like to express yourself, contact this guy, Jay, at thinktechhawaii.com. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech, but first, we want to thank our underwriters. <laughs> Okay, Richard, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on OC16 several times a week. Can't get enough of it, just like Richard does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech on OC16, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a volunteer, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Richard Melendez. Aloha, everyone. Oh, oh.